Hi, I'm Nicholas Chen, and I'm the product manager for DeltaFlow.OS, Riverlane's operating system for quantum computers. In this talk, I'll be walking you through what an OS does and why an OS will help make quantum computers useful sooner. I want to start by setting some context about what an operating system does with a familiar device that we use every day, a mobile phone. So I'm sure that you, like myself, have probably made extensive use of apps that rely on your current location. You know, things like Uber or Maps. What you might not be aware of is the tremendous amount of work the operating system is doing behind the scenes to make these apps possible. These include computing your location. So when you're outdoors, the OS uses the GPS signal from satellites. But when you're indoors and can't get a GPS signal, the OS switches over to estimating your location using the Wi-Fi networks around you. The OS is also connecting to the network and downloading data, like map data, on behalf of the app. Lastly, it's also the OS that's translating the raw sensor readings on the touchscreen into the pinching and zooming gestures for controlling the app's user interface. Without an operating system, app developers would have had to implement all of these functions and more from scratch. The work this represents means there's a really good chance these apps wouldn't exist, even though the hardware has these capabilities. This is why I like to think of the role of an operating system as unlocking the full potential of the hardware. So let's connect this idea to quantum computers. Like pretty much everyone else in the quantum computing industry, I'm tremendously excited about how quantum computing will give us tools to tackle major challenges in healthcare, manufacturing, climate change, and transportation. Quantum computing will bring about unprecedented human progress as significant as the industrial and digital revolutions. Quantum computing will have massive positive impact on people's lives and also create a ton of economic value. But one big challenge standing in the way of this vision is how sensitive qubits are to being disturbed. So as computations are running, things like noise from the environment and even from neighboring qubits cause errors and make the results of the computation incorrect and unusable. These errors put a ceiling on the size and complexity of the problem you can run through a quantum computer. So our estimates show that we need to reach about a 10,000x reduction in system errors to solve commercially valuable problems. So there are two ways to close this gap. The first is to make better qubits. This could mean isolating them from each other and the environment a little bit better, or controlling them more accurately. We absolutely need to do this, but making hardware even 10x better is expensive and slow. So to take us the rest of the way, we need a second approach. The second approach is to use software to make better use of the imperfect qubits we can build. This is what's called quantum error correction. Hopefully you're seeing where I'm going with this. We need to build some software to help unlock the full potential of the hardware that we have. So how important is quantum error correction? Well, in estimates that Riverlane and other groups have performed, we see some clear limits on the type of problems quantum computers without error correction can tackle. So while there's definitely some value in increasing the number of qubits of the noisy computers we have today, the size of this market quickly tops out because these problems can also be solved using classical approaches like supercomputers and GPUs. The really high value applications for quantum computers, solving the problems that supercomputers and GPUs can never solve, will all require quantum error correction. At this point, I think it's important to give everyone a high level intuition about what quantum error correction involves. Like before, I'll start with a demonstration with a much more familiar classical example. So on the left, I have a QR code that will take you to the Riverlane website. What might be surprising is that I can cover up a fairly large chunk of the QR code with a black rectangle, effectively changing a bunch of the white squares to black squares, and the QR code will still work. You don't have to take my word for it, of course. Go ahead and try scanning the QR code on the right and you can check that it still works. So all error correction, whether classical or quantum, revolves around storing extra information. In the QR code on the right, there's enough extra information in the error-free areas to let your phone work out that there's been an error and get the original data out. This is, of course, very useful for QR codes because in the real world, parts of the code might get damaged or faded or covered up. 
You'll also notice that the extra information doesn't necessarily have to be a copy. The part of the QR code that got covered up isn't repeated anywhere else. So quantum error correction works in a similar way. In quantum error correction, we use many noisy physical qubits to build one reliable, error-free, logical qubit. If one of these noisy qubits suffers from an error, we can use the remaining qubits to detect and correct the error. There are a couple of challenges that make the quantum version a little bit harder. So one of these challenges is that you can't directly examine the qubits storing your data to find out what, if anything, happened. Instead, we actually have to use additional qubits to indirectly observe what's happened. So like a detective who's given some clues at a crime scene and has to reconstruct what happened, the error correction system has to piece together what specific errors occurred based on some very limited observations. We call this task decoding, and it needs to be done very quickly in order to keep up with the errors that are happening. OK, let's put this together. If we want to build an OS that handles the complexity of quantum error correction, what would it need to do? So the most important thing is that it would need to do this repeated cycle of measuring qubits to extract syndromes. So syndromes is the technical term for the clues we're able to observe. Every logical qubit will be made up of hundreds of physical qubits, so the number of measurements needed per cycle really starts to add up. Next, we have to determine what errors have happened. And as I explained earlier, this is a hard problem, and it needs to be done really, really quickly. Finally, we have to plan out how to correct the error. So this could be to fix it immediately. But an alternative approach might be to adjust uh, subsequent operations to take this error into account. So there are a lot of different ways to build an OS. Uh, and the best way is really not clear, since we're still in the early days of quantum OS design. But to kind of give us a hint and to guide us, we identified some key requirements that we wanted in our design. I'll first share these, and then I'll explain how our design achieves these goals. So performance is a top priority. As I mentioned earlier, the system needs to keep up with errors. But many errors are actually the result of performing computational operations. So the speed of a quantum computer can never exceed that of the error correction cycle. We need to make sure that the error correction occurs as quickly as possible, because any gains we make there directly translates into a faster quantum computer. Modularity is also really important, because technology is changing so quickly, and the OS has to be able to incorporate some new developments. Finally, we want the OS to be extensible enough to support a wide variety of applications. The interface it presents two applications must make it considerably simpler to develop these applications. Now I'll explain what we do in deltaflow.os. So the core of the OS is called the kernel, and it's designed to run the error correction cycle as performantly as possible. To do this, the components that make up the kernel need to work together very, very closely. The upper part of the kernel is the runtime, and this takes as input a quantum program. It kicks off the error correction cycle and instructs the control system to start performing the operations on the qubits. The lower part of the kernel needs to be tightly coupled. The control system is the interface of the qubits and needs to sit very close to them. The measurement it makes then needs to move really, really quickly over to the decoder so that the errors are identified and tracked. Something I mentioned earlier is that most errors don't need to be corrected immediately. Detecting them and being aware of their existence is sufficient because we can often alter subsequent operations to take the errors into account and then getting rid of them as a result. And this is really, really good news because the runtime doesn't need to operate in lockstep with the control system and decoder, which simplifies the architecture. This gives the runtime a larger time budget to schedule upcoming operations without bottlenecking the system. You'll notice that in the design of the OS, we've separated out these three key components. Rather than building everything together as a single block, we have invested in defining interfaces between components to ensure they can be changed out if needed. We see two big reasons for needing to change things out. The first is to take advantage of new improvements. We're constantly seeing opportunities to improve the control system, decoder, and our runtime implementation, and we expect this to continue. 
Modularity ensures that each component can improve at its own pace and that new versions don't cause the system to suddenly break. The second reason is to allow our OS to support a variety of qubit types. To support a given hardware partner's qubits, we'll probably need to do custom work across all three components. One learning we've made is that the OS cannot afford to be qubit agnostic. A one-size-fits-all approach sacrifices far too much performance. Instead, we need to be qubit agile. Modularity helps make inserting these custom parts as quick and painless as possible. OK, to wrap everything up, let's put the kernel in context with the software it supports. So applications are the quantum programs that will tackle the high value problems that we showed earlier. In addition to building the OS, Riverlane has teams working on building applications for chemistry, for example. But we actually expect the vast majority of these applications to come out of the quantum ecosystem. The OS helps accelerate application development by allowing the people writing these quantum programs to think exclusively in terms of error-free logical qubits, while the OS does the hard work and essential task of error correction in the background. To conclude, the main thing I hope you take away from this talk is that quantum error correction is absolutely critical to unlocking high-value quantum applications. I've shown at a high level the steps needed to perform quantum error correction and the complicated coordination problem this poses if we want to do it quickly and correctly. Finally, I've shared the overall design for, for DeltaFloat.OS, Riverlane's operating system for quantum computers, which we've designed to be performant, modular, and extensible. By shouldering the responsibility of quantum error correction, Riverlane's OS frees application developers and hardware companies to focus and move faster on problems that they are uniquely positioned to solve. This will help make quantum computers useful sooner. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we go into much more detail in a number of articles on our website at www.riverlane.com. Thanks.